Hey guys, uh, I'm Chuang. Thanks for dropping by my channel, Do More. Now, my channel is all about um, being your own boss, uh, investing your money wisely, and being the best person that you can be. So, today I spoke to a, a very amazing person called uh, Professor uh, Dr. Tio Su Huang. She's a woman of science, but she's also doing amazing things in the field of cancer research uh, in Malaysia. Now, she's doing some amazing things in the context of uh, cancer among Asian people and Malaysians in particular, which is a field that not much uh, is known about in the world. If you like this video, please share it, comment on it, and tell me what you think in the comments below. Thank you very much. Okay, Su Huang, thank you for joining me. I've been watching you from afar. The kind of stuff that you do at the Cancer Research Malaysia is amazing. I think to um, to get straight to the number of it all, I think that what you're trying to do in terms of um, investigating Asian-specific cancer is very important, especially now with our lifestyles and our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I think to kick off the discussion, is there is cancer in a way racist? Is there an Asian cancer? Is there a Chinese cancer? And if so, why? Well, Asians make up half of the world's population. And today, Asians make up less than 5% of the studies in cancer research. So the reality is what we know about cancer is mostly coming from cancer research that's done in North America, in Europe, in Australia, and in other Caucasian-based countries. So we assume that we know a lot about cancer, but most of what we know actually comes from the West in European populations. So, but when you look at cancer incidence globally, then I think there are several things to point out. First, there are some cancers which are different in prevalence simply because the risk factors are different. So for example, lung cancer is getting a lot more common in the Asian population because smoking is decreasing in the West and increasing in Asia. So it's due to a risk factor that we know about. Same for liver cancer, which is associated with the hepatitis B virus. But there are other cancers which are simply more common not just because of risk factors. So for example, if you look at nasopharyngeal cancer, you know, a white man living in California has got roughly 40 times less risk of nasopharyngeal cancer than a Bidayu man living in Sarawak. And the Bidayu in Sarawak actually have one of the highest risk of developing nasopharyngeal cancer in the world. And this is something, one of the differences in terms of the spectrum of cancers that we face and why it's different in the West and as it is in Asia. So why is that the case? Is it something which is genetically predisposed? Or is it something which is of, of a particular skin tone, for example? Or is it because of the weather? What kind of countervailing factors? Yeah, I think to be able to understand that, we first need to acknowledge that unlike heart disease, which is one disease or one cluster of diseases, etc., cancer is about 200 different diseases, right? 200 different diseases. So the challenge in understanding cancer sometimes is that what we assume to be true of one cancer doesn't actually apply to another cancer and that makes this picture a lot more difficult. So you know to be able to understand genetics and how big a contribution genetics has on cancer we need to think about what um, what is the genetic contribution of cancer. Overall I would say genetics contributes to maybe 30% of all cancers, 30 to 50% of cancers, but it's variable depending on the type of cancer. So if you look at lung cancer, for example, lung cancer in men is almost 100%, almost 100% because of smoking and very little contribution of genetics. But, lung, uh, but breast cancer, for example, probably has about 50% genetics and, and only a small combination of factors such as smoking or alcohol and other things. So I think we can't generalize, right? For some of the distribution, some of the reasons why some cancers are more common in Asia because of lifestyle factors, like liver, like lung, but some of it is because of genetics, like nasopharyngeal cancer is one classic example. So why is that the case? So, so that means basically if your dad or your mum or someone within your direct family lineage had a nasopharyngeal, which is I think a nose and lung, right? Yeah, just um, nose. Just nose, yeah. okay. Um, then you're more likely to get it or 50% more likely to get it? Yeah, so not 50% more likely, but you usually it's about, um, depending on the type of cancer, yes, about... 80%, um, 80 to 100% more likely to get it compared to someone 80 who... 80 to 100%? More likely to get it. It doesn't mean you have an 80% chance of getting it. You have an 80% higher chance of getting wow. it. So that's a very big difference. So if your baseline risk is 2% chance of getting nasopharyngeal cancer, then a 100% increase in risk puts you at 4% chance of getting cancer. I see. Not go from 2% to 98% chance of getting the I cancer. See. I think there's a difference in inc percentage increase versus actually absolute increase, right? So it's an important kind of stats if you like to get, to get a handle on. 
So I think in terms of Asian cancers, we need to take note of three things, right? Number one, we know that our genes make an impact on cancer, more impact on some cancers compared to others. Number two, we know our diet and our lifestyle factors have got a lot to do with cancer. And our diet not only is an important um, risk factor for cancer, so for example, how much vegetables we eat influences our risk of colorectal cancer. How much we're exposed to secondhand smoke influences our risk to lung cancer, for example. But it's actually a lot more than that. We're starting to discover that the bugs that grow in our gut, what we call the microbiome uh, that lives in our gut, you know, normal things, actually influences how well our immune system protects us from cancer and how well our immune system gets rid of the cancer if we do have cancer. So we're starting to learn that actually Asians, because we have a different microbiome, may influence the competence or our ability to fight cancer and our ability to respond to treatments if we do have cancer. And then the third area is really, um, actually we don't say this enough, but um, survival from cancer um, has a lot to do with our beliefs. And our beliefs are different between Asians and Caucasians, right? For example, how fatalistic we are, what we think of the meaning of life, why we're here on earth, what is the value of family, what's the, and beyond that, who makes decisions, how decisions are made, what's the purpose of money, who do we give our money to, etc., influences whether we'll pay for treatment or whether we'll leave it for our children, right? Whether we're prepared to go for screening or we would rather go and have a, have a family holiday. Sometimes our beliefs influences not just, not just our risk to disease, it also influences our propensity to get cured from a disease. And the lifespan or the longevity of, of, your, of your being once you get that, if, if and when you get diagnosed. But let's just rewind to the start in the genetic predisposed position of, of human beings, and especially in the Malaysian um, um, population. Citizen, population. Yeah. Um, what, in, in your 20 plus years of research at, at CRM, right, Cancer Research Malaysia, what have you discovered? And specifically because in Malaysia you've got the Malays, you've got the Chinese, then you've got the Indians as well. And that puts a different complexion on your research because three different types of people, three different genetic predispositions. Uh, what have you learned about those? Yeah, so we lead the largest Asian study on breast cancer. So okay. we have now um, combined between Malaysia and Singapore, we have 16,000 women in this study, right? And it's, um, it's not been easy to take this journey to try and reestablish a really large cohort so that we can understand not only the common factors, we can go in detail and look at the not so common factors. And we can build a model that incorporates the genetic factors, the lifestyle factors, the environmental factors and so on to help us understand why cancers are more likely to occur in some individuals and how do we prevent it from happening as well as how can we screen for those cancers more effectively. So when we started off, we already knew that you know, um, Australian women, for example, have one of the highest risk of developing uh, breast cancer, right? They have roughly a one in nine lifetime risk of developing breast wow. cancer. That's Com huge. It is huge, yeah. Compared to one in 12 in an American woman, thereabouts for, an, for a British woman, compared to one in maybe 15 or 16 for a Chinese woman in Malaysia, compared to one in 28 for a Malay woman living in Malaysia. So we know that there's that difference in risk, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. But our research has shown that most of that risk can be explained not by genetics, not by environmental factors, but by how many children the woman has oh. and the age at which they have that children and their consumption to some extent of soy and soy. their physical activity. My yeah. goodness. Okay. So, so I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we don't quite sit back and reflect that actually my grandmother had a much lower risk, you know, had a roughly threefold lower risk of breast cancer compared to my what my daughter will have. And that's because my grandmother, you know, bless her, had started having children when she was 19, continued having children and she, until she was 44. She had six healthy children. She had breast, breastfed most of them. She, had, she really had a very healthy diet, was physically very active, and that meant that you know, her risk of developing breast cancer was really small. It was probably one in 40, something like that. So generally speaking, if you have the children earlier in life, then yeah. you're healthier by way of body, and then your risk of breast cancer specifically yeah. diminishes, right? That's correct. So yeah. if you now, because Not today... Not quite so straightforward, Chuan. Okay. So this is where we make a mistake, particularly for breast cancer. We think of breast cancer risk when we are 40, 
right? We think, oh, this is a period which we need to be aware. We, are, we need to be aware of breast screening and so on. But risk of breast cancer is actually laid down, we estimate, from the, from the time that you're about six. I'm going to repeat that. From the time that you're about six, as a girl, that's when breast cancer risk starts to be laid down. Wow. Because we know that if, you know, in, in my grand, going back to my grandmother, my grandmother started having her period when she was about 18, right? So she was able to have children from when she was 19, etc. So she was about 18. My mother was probably about 14. I had my period when I was about 13. My daughter, luckily, at about 12, 13, thereabouts, right? But many of my daughter's generation start having their periods when they're nine or 10. My goodness. And this is a trend that is happening. It's getting younger and younger. It's getting younger and younger. And every year of cha difference in age of menarche increases your breast cancer risk, we think, by about 15%. So the younger you are when you have your first menstruation, yes. the higher the chances of yes. getting breast cancer. Yes. So, 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 so it's really weird, but you know, to be able to understand a disease like breast cancer, you can't just study that disease in women in their 40s. You have to try and understand at a population level, why is the age of menarche changing? Is it because of... Health, too healthy diets. You know, there's one hypothesis which says that women are, girls are just getting diets which are way too healthy, and because they they are too healthy, they're able to be reproductive at a younger age, right? And and that's a maybe a good thing. I don't know, but what the consequence, the biological consequence, is that when they have their periods at a young age, their periods are really erratic. Their cells undergo a lot of hormonal changes, and that changes the nature of the breast in a way that then transpires much later on to a higher risk of cancer. So that's one period that, in which that is laid down. And then while you are developing as a girl and during the years in puberty, that what happens during that period is also really important. Um, that's the second period where, where, where um, risk is laid down. And the third period is when you have children. So we all, say, we all know that having children younger puts you at lower risk of cancer. But if you look at my grandmother, started at 19, right, having children. My mother started having children at 25. I, started, I had my first child when I was 32. And it's very normal. Now there are very many people who start having their first child at 35, right? Yeah. Any protective effect of having children disappears after the age of 30. Ah, so, so the reality is that uh, even though I have two children, there, there's no protective effect as, associated with breast cancer. With, with those. So uh, from these population changes, that's why I say that actually when we look at why it is our risk to breast cancer is changing dramatically, it's not actually due to genetics. We don't have some intrinsic genetic factor that makes Asians less likely to bre get breast cancer. If you move an uh, Asian person you know, to America, within uh, two generations, her risk of breast cancer is identical to that in a Caucasian, uh, Caucasian woman. There's no difference in risk to disease. Most of it is due to parity, breastfeeding, a bit due to diet and exercise, right? So we need to change what we think of a disease like breast cancer, at least, to try and understand that this is a disease that is primarily driven by lifestyle and primarily one in which if we want to handle prevention of breast cancer, we need to take it seriously from school going age all the way until a woman is maybe 75 years old. So for the typical Malaysian female, would breast cancer be the most common cancer? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then by far away, and the second one would be? Yeah. So the stats, the cancer statistics are not very well acc uh, accumulated. But we know that across uh, about 137 countries in the world, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. Um, for the remaining countries, you know, a handful of countries like in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, cervical cancer is the most common and breast cancer is number two. So why is breast cancer, you know, so in Malaysia, one in three um, cancers, uh, of all the cancers in women, one in three would be a breast cancer. Of all the cancers in men and women combined, one in five is a breast cancer. So even when you combine men and women's stats together, breast cancer is still the most common cancer. And this is set to increase. So it's not going to come down. It's going to go up at about 3% a year is what we currently estimate. And it's a lifestyle issue. As women stay in the workforce longer and they put off having a child longer, that's what you're going to yeah. get. So what do we say as a public health policy then? What do you say to yeah, a woman from a public health policy? Because obviously I'm in a generation that wants you know, female equality for women. Yeah. We need to have women in the workforce if we're going to try and 
get Malaysia out of an income trap, right? We need to have a more economically productive workforce. We can't ask women to just stay home and have kids. We have to get them into the the system. So how there's, are we going to do that? There's consequences in terms of having that potential risk happen to you. That's correct, yeah. So mm. obviously that's, that's a conundrum <laughs> that can't be solved overnight. Con- yeah. What about for men though? What about Malaysian males? What is the most common? Right. So let me finish with with women first. So breast cancer is the most common, followed by lung cancer and then colorectal cancer. So lung and colorectal keep swapping between two and three, but more or less those are the three most common cancers. And in men, on the other hand, lung cancer is already number one or number two with colorectal cancer. And then nasopharyngeal cancer might be third or fourth or fifth, somewhere along the top five within the country. We have problems with cancer statistics in this country because there's no mandatory reporting of cancer. That means that if you have a dengue case, for example, the hospital is required by law to report that dengue case or malarial case or HIV case or whatever, that's mandatory reporting. But cancer reporting is not mandatory, which basically means that we have very bad cancer statistics. We don't have accurate data. And for example, if you want to kind of cite cancer numbers in this country, as of today, we're 2019 at the moment, we only have cancer statistics published until 2011. I know there's a working draft for the cancer statistics from 2012 to 2016, but we are way behind in terms of cancer surveillance. We do not know the numbers of cancers that we have in this country. So without getting to the whys and wherefores of why that's the omission, what is the informal uh, conclusions where a cancer... Um, the prevalence is, is where Malaysia is concerned. Yeah, so I, I think um, guesstimate would be to say that we probably have about 35,000 new cancer cases a year. Every year. Yeah, 35 to 40,000 new cancer cases per year. As a right? percentage of population per capita, where does Malaysia sit on the cancer occurrence level? Um, not low, not high. You know, I, and I think um, it, it's misleading to kind of talk about whether there are more, whether there are areas that have a higher prevalence of cancer versus lower prevalence of cancer, because cancer increases with age. So cancer incidence is very related to the demographics of your population. So in other words, for a population like um, Japan, yeah. they have a very high cancer incidence, really? and that's because most of their population are it's over old. the age of 65, right? right? But if you look at you know what their incidence is on the age standardized um, comparison, then for breast cancer, for example, Japan has a lower risk of breast cancer compared to uh, a white American living in, in the US, for example. So it's not fair to compare in that way. I think what's important to note is, you know, what are the most common cancers? Uh, number one, what are the most common cancers and what can we do about making sure that we don't catch up with the US or Europe in terms of cancer incidence of the common cancers. And then number two, are what are the cancers that affect us disproportionately and what can we do about those? Because there, there are several problems with cancers that affect Asians disproportionately. Number one, because they occur in Asia and most of the research centers are not in Asia, that basically means you cannot collect patients, you cannot collect tissue samples, you cannot build the research tools and you cannot develop cures, right? So for example, with nasopharyngeal cancer, the way in which uh, scientists like me study a disease is we take cancers from patients with their permission, we grow them in a lab, for example, we make them into cancer lines, we grow them in an animal to see how the cancer grows, we knock out certain genes, we put in certain drugs, and we test in those models to see whether we can kill those cancers more effectively. And we do that in animals because it's much faster. And only after we've done that and we've got identified a cure, then we go back and test them in human beings and see is it safe before we see is it effective and is it better than what we currently do. That's what we do in clinical trials. But the reality is for a disease like nasopharyngeal cancer, we don't even have the tissue banks. We don't have the t- data. And we have zero animals, zero animal models for nasopharyngeal cancer. And it's partly because this is a disease in Asia. We just don't study it because the majority of the cancer research centers are not here, not in Asia, they're elsewhere. Wow, okay, so there's obviously this huge omission which affects the research that you do and the efficacy of that research. That's correct. But as you said, among males, nasopharyngeal is still number two, number three, which is That's very correct. high. Yeah. Um, and then liver is two or three as well interchangeably, yeah. but the number one is lung cancer. Yeah. I think you told me before that lung cancer among males 
is specifically directly linked, can be linked to, to smoking, which is clear. But it's not the case with women. And I want to cite my particular personal case where my sister um, demised from lung cancer three years ago, two, three years ago. She was an avowed non-smoker. And the doctor at the time told me that there's a huge prevalence of lung cancer among non-smoking Chinese Asians, I think was his word, right? Now, why is that the case? Yeah, Chang, I'm really sorry to hear yeah. about your sister. And unfortunately, um, this is something that we still have almost zero understanding about, right? So if you see, a, um, you know, you, you can, it, among men with lung cancer, um, 90%, 80 to 90% of those individuals are either current smokers or previous smokers, right? And lung cancer incidence in men is increasing at a very fast rate in Asia, simply because in Malaysia, about 45 to 49 percent of men smoke. Is that a, is that 45 a fact? 45. So to one 40. out of every two men in Malaysia smoke. Yes. Wow. That is crazy. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. I mean, the smoking prevalence in women is much lower. It's maybe about five to 10 percent. And this epidemic is only getting worse because when we have, when others have done surveys of um, Form 4 boys, for example, particularly in government schools, it can be as high as 70% of wow. them have already picked up smoking. The rebel without some, a cause thing, right? Absolutely. And some from the age of eight, right? In Indonesia, especially, a lot of... Yeah, um, so, so there's a lot of that. And, and so uh, a lot of the lung cancer in men is going to be either due to primary smoking or secondary smoking, right? And it's very hard to kick that problem because, because of the age at which they're picking up. So if you're becoming a smoker when you are um, young, actually it's inbuilt into your pharmacology and to try and kick, it, kick that habit is really hard. But if you picked it up fairly casually when you're in your 30s, to try and give it up actually is much easier because it's not as ingrained within your pharmacology or your physiology of your body, etc. But if we were to look at it in women, on the other hand, you know, similar to men, it's not number one cancer, breast cancer is number one, but it's fairly up there. So why is that? Why do you have high incidence when only 5 to 10% of women smoke? So part of it is due to smoking, secondhand smoke. Because right? maybe the husbands are smoking? Absolutely. Okay. Either the husbands are smoking or they work in a work environment where, cooking maybe? where smoking is, is prevalent, etc. But that only explains um, only about 50 to 65 percent of uh, women who, who develop lung cancer have either come across secondhand smoke or smokers themselves, right? And the remaining, we actually don't know why, that, why those women get lung cancer. And for Asian women, the proportion of non-smokers who get lung cancer appears to be higher, and we don't understand why. So there's been a number of research studies to try and tease that out, to try and work out why is it Asian women are getting this disease and this specific type of disease. They, they, there are many types of lung cancer. You know, lung cancer isn't one disease, just like breast cancer isn't one disease. It is many different types of diseases at the molecular level, and each disease has a different ca uh, evolution to become that, ca that disease, right? And for lung cancer in women, what we now know is that there's something peculiar about the, the women, Asian females that are getting this. And it's not just Malaysian Chinese, it's also the Japanese and Koreans and you know, people in mainland China and so on. So when, when researchers have tried to compare uh, what we call case control studies, that means we get a bunch of women who have lung cancer and a bunch of healthy women who don't have the lung cancer and we ask them and we try and figure out what's different between these two groups so that we can identify what we call a risk factor. Then, so far, some researchers in Singapore suggest that maybe it's walk frying. They find that women who are more likely to spend a lot of their time frying, you know, co cooking using a wok and usually certain types of wok may have a higher propensity to develop lung cancer. But the excess risk is only very small. It accounts for a very small proportion of the lung cancers that occur in Asian female non-smokers. So the research is still open, it's an open-ended question. And we've been trying, I mean, at a personal level, I've been trying to crack at this nut for, for some time with no resources as well as no manpower, but I've been trying to figure out how do we do this better? How do we get a handle at lung cancer? Right, really trying to understand what goes wrong in the, in the lungs of Asian women that makes them more likely to develop lung cancer, right? In this particular type of lung cancer. And we haven't figured out how to do it. So very recently, we started a research program to see whether we could um, take lung tissue 
and try and work out what went wrong in that lung tissue. Because if we understand what goes wrong in that lung tissue and what was the source of an external factor that changed the genetics of that lung tissue, we could begin to understand you know, what might be the... the what might be the external factor that caused that, that cancer, right? So a very good friend of mine, Nick Serena, who's a geneticist in Cambridge, had this really nice analogy of how she described looking at genetics, right? Which is that, you know, imagine, I'm sure you've done this, you know, you've gone to the beach and you've seen on the beach, you know, lots and lots of footprints, right? But you can immediately look at that and say, oh, um, uh, adults have been here, children have been here, and a couple of birds have been here as well because you can see the footprints in the sand, right? So in the same way, an external agent that mutates the DNA of a normal cell and makes that DNA now abnormal and make it grow like a cancer cell leaves a footprint on that DNA, right? So geneticists like me can go in and sequence that footprint and analyze that footprint and, and match make it and say, hey, this was a bird or this was a baby or this was an adult male that's about 200 pounds and needs to go on diet, etc. But effectively, we can go and look at the genomes of a cancer and work out what was the mutagen, what was the external factor that caused this cancer to develop. I would love to be able to do that in, in, for Asian women to try and work out why are Asian women developing this disease. At the moment, I can't figure out how to get normal lungs. Yeah, because obviously you have to get uh, perfectly normal, healthy living lung tissue from a, from a living person and that would obviously be highly invasive and non, non-permissive, right, at some level. I could um, ask you for some skin and you probably would, <laughs> might give me some skin. Skin is okay, <laughs> some blood in my ear will be fine, but to, you know, and then if you're a female. So, so obviously you're working with the limitations and then there's scientific conclusions and then there's informal personal conclusions based on your work as a geneticist and a scientist. What are some, you know, obviously informal conclusions that you come to in, in terms of why Asian females are so susceptible f- to lung cancer? The answer is we don't know. Still? We still don't know. Wow. It is almost uh, what, what is the most zero. far out um, conclusions that you can have come to, but the most feasible? Well, I suppose my favorite um, hypothesis at the moment is that there's something about this, the um, the environment in which we le- live that is a carcinogen and it somehow interacts with our propensity to in, in our immune system that changes the structure of the lung. And where that's coming from is there's been now a couple of published uh, genomic studies of lung cancer in uh, Chinese women and those studies in... Uh, so, so this is not looking at healthy lung, this is looking at cancer tissue and asking the question of in cancer tissue, um, of lung cancer in females in Asia versus lung cancer in females in Caucasia, what's different, right? And what they find is that there's something to do with the immune system. There's a higher propensity for inflammation in the Asian lung, and the challenge is to try and figure out what caused that inflammation. Is that internal or external, right? So for example, our own research in breast cancer shows that there's a genetic factor that's found in about 60% of Asian women, that's only found in about 15% of Caucasian women, that's associated with a 20% increase in risk to breast cancer. So a very small increase in risk to breast cancer. It's the same as, you know, um, the, the risk is about the same as um, someone um, having their periods from at 12 versus someone having their periods at 14, for example. So only a small increase in risk. But this factor is associated with a propensity to develop um, uh, tumours that attracts the immune system or inflammation to come into to that tissue, right? And what that trigger point is, we don't yet know. We don't yet know. And, and, and this, this is an, I mean, overarching in terms of thinking through um, Asians versus Caucasians. This is actually well known. You know, if you look at other inflammation-associated diseases, like SLE, Right, systemic lupus erythromatosis, which is an autoimmune, autoimmune disease. disease right? Right. Yeah. That autoimmune disease is much higher in Asian women than it is in Caucasian women. And why is that? Partly genetics. There have been a number of genetic factors that have been uh, identified, but partly an environmental factor, an environmental trigger that we still don't know. 
If you look at rheumatoid arthritis, there's some data to say that rheumatoid arthritis may also be more common in the Asian population compared to the Caucasian population. So I think as we learn and begin to compare more about across populations, and you must remember, a lot of this research is only now starting to emerge because traditionally, Asians have been left out in research, in medical research. There's just simply not enough um, medical research that's done in Asians because all of the big money, all of the big centers are in the West. Right? If you think about philanthropy in the West, you know, think about the Gates Foundation, think about the Wellcome Trust, think about the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a whole string of others. Those are just big names. Think of Rockefeller Institute, etc. You can think of all of these big names they're all philanthropists who felt that their legacy isn't to give the money to their children, but their legacy or to build great companies. Yes, that's important. But their legacy was about giving something back to humanity by enabling long-term research, medical research that improves the livelihoods of millions of people. Well, hopefully things will change, but I just want to cite some numbers here because you told me offline that Cancer Research Malaysia gets by on something like six million ringgit a year which is about a million and a half US dollars versus your counterpart in the UK, which gets what, six billion pounds, which is 20, what, 30, 30 billion ringgit. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I can't even do the multiple there. Um, but, but also, well, tell me about the, the, the outlier incidences, right? The, the facts, for example, where a, a male, for example, 79 years old, who might have been smoking since he was 12 years old, never has gotten cancer. Or the, or, or you know, I, this is basically my father lah. Okay, he's seventy nine. He's been smoking since he was twelve years old. No cancer. Bless his soul. Touch wood, right? Um, even my father in law, right? He's a smoker. He's been smoking heavily back and a half at least for the last fifty years. You know, outside in the hot sun, you know, burned by the sun on his motorbike. No cancer. And then my sister, who's not a smoker, bam. So wh why do these outlier ex examples exist? How do I answer that? I think um, the the reality the reality is that and and don't share this with smokers yeah. somehow. Okay. The reality is many smokers will not get cancer. Okay, right? because of the genetic predisposition. No, because it's a random thing. Oh. We don't we don't know. So, so it's, a <laughs> cancer, it's a crapshoot. Cancer is a crapshoot. It's a it's basically a, a it's random. It just th there is no method to the madness. Well, it's all about propensity, right? So, so in other words, um, it, isn't the, it isn't the same as... Um, and th this is the reason why. If you look at a bacteria infection, it's a, you, know, you have a bacteria and whether it can infect or not infect is a single step event, right? But for cancer to develop, it, we estimate that it needs to be minimum seven genetic changes that take place in one single cell in order for that single cell to develop into a cancer. So what that means is that if you're a smoker, you have many more cells that have acquired that one genetic change, right? And a few of that cells would acquire the second genetic change. A few more will acquire the third, et cetera, et cetera. You know? And of course, if it happens sequentially, then none of us would get cancer. But the point is that sometimes the, that genetic change takes place in something that causes that cell that has that genetic change to suddenly grow out of control. So in other words, in a field where everyone has got one genetic change, this one who developed a genetic change in one critical gene now becomes a thousand cells as opposed to everything else. So it, it grows out, right? And that thousand cells now occupies a much bigger space and a subset of those might accumulate a second genetic change and then a third genetic change and a fourth genetic change. Each step of that genetic change uh, uh, select, selects for the things that gives that particular cell a growth advantage. So what you're basically saying is that um, even though you're a smoker, that's only one of many six or seven uh, circumstances that will contribute to your either you get it or you don't get it. Yeah. So for those who have gotten it, they've gotten have they've had at least six to seven factors that have altered the the structure of the cell. That's correct. Yeah. And most of, for smokers, most of all, nearly all seven changes would have taken place because of some, a carcinogen that was present in the cigarette smoke. But okay. the point is that you might get lucky. You might have a million cells in your body that have two genetic changes, four genetic changes, but not three genetic to trigger But it. not enough to trigger it. The whole point is that you're taking a chance on your life because 
for the person who is not a smoker, you, prob- you have much, much fewer cells that have that genetic change. So the whole point is that, yes, many smokers are not going to get lung cancer, but you want to die with lung cancer. I mean, yeah. it's a terrible way to die. Yeah, it's terrible. You, it's a really, really terrible way to die. And we, we maybe need to ask ourselves, you know, um, the, the right question, in my view at least, it's not um, why is it some smokers don't get lung cancer. The right question is, you know, how many, sm- how many people are going to die a gory death rather than one in which they, 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 they die of something else that is yeah. hopefully a little bit more pleasant to die with. So, so what are some of the other factors? I mean, now we talk about how our lives are so filled with stress and there's a lot of, you know, we work longer hours than ever before, we're so stressed out than ever before, there's a lot of alcohol consumption, um, all these things will come into the picture. Those factors, how, how much of a factor do they play? We have not enough data in the Asian population. So in the West, what, what we've been able to do in the West is we collect, um, we, let's say, recruit a million people. You know, there's a million women study yeah. in the UK, for example, that accumulate these women when they are healthy and well, and then they follow them for years and years. So for example, a study that was done in Europe called the EPIC study recruited hundreds of thousands of individuals and started in 1968 and they're still in follow-up, right? So these kind of studies allow us to tell over time, a really long time, what is the percentage of cancer that's due to one risk factor versus another. And so when that's been done, they've been able to show that 30 to 50% of cancers that occur in the Western population are due to factors such as cigarette smoking, uh, diet, particularly uh, fiber and processed food and, and so on, and infection, right? Infection from for example, the hepatitis, the human papilloma virus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they can say that 30 to 50 percent of cancers in the European population are preventable because of this type of data. There's no such data in the Asian population. We do not have these large cohorts that have been followed up for long enough that enables us to say what percentage of cancer is preventable. What percentage of cancer can we ascribe to this particular factor versus this other particular factor? Those studies have started in in Asia now, some about 10 years ago. And over the next 10 years or so, a lot of these research results will start to emerge so that we can begin to tell in the Asian population how much risk of cancer can be prevented and using what factors, using what tools can we actually do that. But for now, what we do is look at case control studies. And when we look at case control studies, what is very clear is smoking is by far the most important risk factor that we need to handle it will probably account for, I would say, about 20% of cancers overall is due to this one risk factor, smoking. The second, I would say, is a combination of diet and obesity, exercise. So a thin person who doesn't exercise has a high, potentially a higher risk of cancer than a fat person who exercises all the time. Wow. Right? Okay. And people don't understand this because Asians are obsessed with um, how we look more than how much we exercise. Unfortunately. Right? Because the reality is we are more, we, we, it, it is how we're, we're culturally mm. built. You know, we, you go to the gym and someone says to you, oh, you better not do this exercise. You know, you'll bulge. Right? Yeah, yeah. For a woman, you don't want to bulge. Yeah, you don't want to, yeah. etc. But it's not about that. It's really about how much activity you have. And we would all love to think that stress causes cancer. But all the studies that have been done so far have failed to find any association, any association wow. between, between stress s- and cancer. They've looked at stress in so many different ways. They've looked at acute stress, long-term stress. There is no association between stress, no direct association, strong association between stress and cancer in a way that you can prove in the same way as you can prove for these three. Smoking, diet and exercise and viruses. These are very causal and you can prove how much effect it has. But stress, the effect may be there, but it's small and hard to quantify. We simply don't know which elements of stress. So obviously, if you don't smoke, great. If you uh, exercise, great. And I, I guess that, that equates to oxygenating your, your body and no. oxygen. No. no. So why is exercise good for you? Yeah, We don't know. We don't fully know <laughs> why exercise wow. is good for us. Okay. Right? Okay. Well, we know that exercise is good for us. 
So we don't know, um, and there are many yeah. hypotheses of why okay. exercise is good for us. So in, in women, for example, in young women who exercise, um, remember we were talking earlier about menarche and when you have menarche, etc. Young women who exercise, for example... Menarche is um, menstruation, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, young women who exercise have better control over their hormones, right? And those hormones have got an impact on... Um, how your cells grow. So, for example, you know, the more you exercise, the more your your periods will become regular faster, right? And, I see. And you are less likely to have the extremes of hormonal exposures. And some of these hormonal exposures drive the growth of cells that could go on to become cancer. They may not be cancer yet, I but see. it could go on to become cancer in the future. So, in right? all circumstances, always exercise, which is. Yeah. Just good for you. Lah. Why yeah. it happens, we don't really know, but yeah. we just know that it's good for you. Yeah. And increasingly, <coughs> we now know that uh, we, we haven't actually got the tools. Previously, we've never really had the tools to understand stress or sleep or exercise properly. But increasingly, some of those tools are now being developed that allows us to go deeper and find out more about how these factors influence our risk of disease. So, for example, you know, the whole area of um, brain research has kind of exploded because we are now able to image the brain more effectively. You know, we're able to ask the question of why do we, why do we sleep? Why do we, how much sleep do we need? What's the point of rapid eye movement sleep versus non-rapid eye movement sleep, for example? You know, how do, what are the consequences on our body when we don't have enough sleep? What are the consequences on our body when we have... Um, stress of a certain type because we all talk about stress as if it's one thing but actually stress is a good thing if there was no stress in our life we would find it hard to get out of bed but the reality is stress is a evolutionarily um, built-in process for human beings and it was created as part of our fight or flight response absolutely right absolutely. so if you have a if you have no stress you're pretty much an underachiever yeah because and your, you never your go immune system weakens right absolutely so your stress is important but it's really about understanding what type of stress right what type of stress is good for you what type of stress is bad for you and how do those influence your risk of disease and like i said to you previously you know even five years ago we had no ability to do that but nowadays, so many people wear wearables. So many people wear technology that enables us to collect data that we, uh, that we now don't know how it links to disease. But in the future, we may be able to predict disease much more effectively. So for example, research in other countries are starting to find that you can actually predict when, um, when there are going to be more heart attacks in, in individuals, just by how much sleep they have, for example. right? You're starting to know that um, you can predict individuals' uh, propensity to get a heart attack, not just by measuring their cholesterol, but by measuring the quality of their sleep. Right? They're starting to measure how a patient's immune system is in ability to fight cancer and the cytokines and the hormones that are involved in ki cancer-fighting properties just by measuring other things that are unrelated, not directly related to cancer per se. So I would say that the future is really bright in terms of our ability to use orthogonal data to try and understand who is at risk of cancer, what can we do about it. I'm not interested in, in I'm not that interested in just understanding and stem collecting why people get cancer or what are the risk factors. I want to change that. I want to make sure that we can reduce it. We can use the information that we gather to really impact on human lives, right? And change the future, if at least not for my generation, for my children's generation, and maybe for their children's children's generation. Yes, but until that day comes when wearables and uh, cancer research is much more prevalent, uh, there's going to be a time lag, obviously, right? Between us and the UK or in the US. Uh, but in the meantime, that transition period, um, you also mentioned, okay, so exercise is one, obviously staying away from cigarettes is another, but you also mentioned sleep, and sleep obviously now we begin to understand is very important, but then you also mentioned viruses, right? W what is this thing about viruses? What viruses specifically? Yeah, so there are a number of viruses that are associated with cancer. You know, for the longest time in the 1950s, all the top cancer researchers were actually virologists. They all thought that cancer was caused by viruses. 
and um, and and the reason was the re the the main reason for was was because they had discovered a chicken virus that you could put into a human cell and infect a human cell and that would acquire all of the cancer characteristics. So for in the 1950s, everyone started to chasing, chase all viruses to try and figure out, you know, could we associate a virus to a cancer and so on. But the, when we whittle that all down, you know, from 70 years of research, we now find that number one is human papilloma virus that's associated not just with cervical cancer, probably about 90% of cervical cancer, but it's also associated with oropharyngeal cancer and with uh, some aspects of uh, esophageal cancer. Then you have the hepatitis B virus and the hepatitis C viruses and a number of other hepatitis, more minor viruses. Which you can that take injections also, for. Which, yes, which, which is associated obviously with liver cancer. Then you have the Epstein-Barr virus, which is associated with nasopharyngeal cancer, for which there's no vaccine that's available. Then you have HIV, which is also associated with uh, uh, Kaposi sarcoma and some other types. It, it diminishes your immune system and that's makes it HIV more, la, basically. more yeah. likely to develop a very, very rare cancer that doesn't happen in immunocompetent individuals and so on. But we, if we look much further, there's not a lot else. You know, there's okay. Helicobacter pylori, which is not a virus. It's a bacterium that is found in your stomach and in, in some individuals, a uh, helicobacter pylori infection increases your propensity to develop uh, gastric cancer and it's an important risk factor. But beyond that, there's, not, there's a whole bunch of other cancers that are absolutely not associated with viruses. So the strategy for cancer is not a one size fit all. We cannot go in there and say, if I take, you know, if I do these uh, three things, I would reduce my cancer risk by 90%. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. If you stop being a smoker, your risk of lung cancer goes down dramatically, but your risk of, um, for example, prostate cancer only goes down marginally, right? If you have breast cancer, you know, and your risk of breast cancer also only goes down marginally. So for breast cancer, you need to then think about exercise. You need to think about diet change in order to significantly reduce your risk. But I think the, the, the way for the future is not just to think about prevention of disease. Prevention is really important. But more critical is for us to work out how do we deliver care to individuals in Asia. Because we are lagging behind, way, way behind. Today, we already know that 70% of the deaths due to cancer, less than 50% of the death uh, to, of the cancer incidents today takes place in low and middle income countries. But 70% of the deaths due to cancer take place in low and middle income countries. In the next 30 years, that's projected to increase to 85% of deaths are going to take place in low and middle income countries. The divide between our ability to cure cancer and our ability to afford a cure for cancer is only going to get much, much bigger. So I feel that it's our duty, of, you know, it's our responsibility in our generation, your generation and mine. I hope we're at the same age. But our generation, give or take, <laughs> give or take yeah. 10 years or yeah. so. But, you know, it's, it's, it's our duty and responsibility to set up the structures, the organizations, the systems to enable us, to enable our children's generation to have a much better chance of controlling non-communicable diseases. Yeah, so some of the stuff that you're doing at CRM is also um, repurposing drugs and also access to facilities. But I, I want to get your point of view, Doc uh, Su Huang, on um, basically this whole issue about chemotherapy. It's highly expensive. It's a hit and miss thing where success ratios are concerned. And I, I'm a bit of a disbeliever in it. Where do you sit on chemotherapy? I think we have to go back and ask the question of evidence. What is evidence and what are anecdotes? You yeah. know, from, from a scientific point of view, we always draw this pyramid, right? And our pyramid at the bottom is um, expert opinion, okay? Expert opinion is essentially um, the lowest rung of evidence. What do you think, Chuang? That's expert opinion. Expert, what do you think, expert, Sue? Yeah. You yeah. Know, that's expert opinion, right? That's absolutely the lowest because it's an opinion based on your experiences. Yeah? Anecdotes. It's, yeah, anecdotes. And we have to acknowledge that that's the worst possible. Then after that comes uh, animal studies, where we kind of study what happens in animals. Then after that comes human trials. And after that comes multi-center trials, like case, con you know, um, randomized controlled trials. And on top of that comes 
what we call meta-analysis, where you take data that's from one study designed in one country with another study designed in another country or a different hospital, etc., and you combine all of those and make a conclusion right at the top, right? So when you look at what is the data that uh, the medical fraternity works with, the medical fraternity only allows itself to work with the top slice of that pyramid. It only allows itself to take meta-analysis or randomized control trials before it will approve a drug. And we do that because we are duty-bound and legally bound to only do things when it, there's evidence-based. When we say it works... Take the best quality research and facts, yeah? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so what does but that tell so, you? So, so that research tells you that chemotherapy saves lives. Oh, it does? Yes. Okay. But the incremental benefit of chemotherapy is different for different cancers, right? So what that means is that if you take a disease like breast cancer, for example, for most breast cancer, the majority of the um, benefit, survival benefit, comes from surgery by a long way. So to cut it out? Yes. Okay. By a really or long way. Or to remove way. the entire breast. That's like correct. Angelina Jolie, yeah. for example. Right. Yeah. Without breast cancer. She didn't have breast cancer. That's right. right? But preventatively, then, she took it that's out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the therapeutic effect comes from surgery. Some of it comes from hormonal therapy and then chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and so on. And only a tiny slice at the top comes from targeted therapy, right? Currently. But that proportion that is due to targeted therapy is only going to increase. Because as we get better and better with uh, developing therapies or chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, etc., the principle of how we're improving in terms of therapy is not to go at it with a carpet bomb. The way we used to give chemotherapy Oof, is, to, yeah. is to kill everything in sight, yeah. right? Essentially, it's like a, it's a, an it's a orange bomb. bomb. It's a yeah. carpet bomb. Essentially, yeah. you're killing any cell that is dividing, right? But now what we do is we, second generation is to try and understand what is it that is different between a cancer cell and a normal cell and only attack the things that are wrong in that cancer cell. And now we're going third generation. We're t targeting only one aspect of that protein that has gone wrong, not all of it. So not all of the ones that are in normal cells. And now we're starting to repurpose how it is that we can train the immune system and so on and so forth. So if we go back to what Cancer Research Malaysia has done, actually my goal, my goal when we first set this up with uh, Tunku Ahmad was a very um, audacious or idealistic goal. Because we basically said there's no cancer research facility, dedicated cancer research facility in Malaysia. How about we set something up that would focus on just cancer in Asians, right? And we called ourselves an initiative because, to be honest, I didn't think we'll exist three years down the line. Why did I not think we'll exist? Because A, cancer research is expensive. As I said, the, today, the, in the National Cancer Institute in the US has a $6 billion budget, annual budget, right? At the time that we set up, we had one million ringgit per year. Six billion, one million. Right, the number of zeros is six billion dollars, one million ringgit. Yes, <laughs> two hundred fifty thousand US dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you, you kind of to have the audacity to think that you can even do anything impactful and still survive after three years. We just think, okay, we were playing. We were just seeing, can we actually set something up? And our goal was simple. Our goal was to just say, can you at least set up the bil basic building blocks? You know, set up cancer cell lines, set up some animal models, set up some tissue banks, try and train some people and see whether you can set it up, right? And that was all that we tried to do. And we succeeded in doing that. But today, where are we? We have a vaccine that can shrink cancers in an animal. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have already met with the US FDA and we're very close to human trials. We think that this could potentially improve the ability of um, patients with oral cancer to fight that oral cancer more effectively, number one. Number two, we now lead the largest study of breast cancer in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Asian population in particular. And we're trying to use that information to enable us to tell each individual woman how, what her risk of cancer is. Angelina Jolie, which you mentioned, took out her breast because she knew she had an 87% chance of developing breast cancer, right? Only 1% of the Malaysian Angelina Jolies today have that information. We're failing. They will only know when they have cancer. But Our opportunity of preventing cancer has already been lost. Correct. Number three, what else have we done? We've developed 
We've created the largest genomic map of Asian breast cancers, and we've now understood that Asian breast cancers are slightly different at the molecular level from Caucasian women, and we're taking that into therapeutic trials. We've already got the design for a new trial that's going to test immunotherapy in Asian breast cancers, and we think this is going to improve the outcome. We've been able to roll out genetic services in the country. So previously, it was only available in about four hospitals, and only 2% of ovarian cancer patients had access to genetic testing. Today, because of the program, we now have 23 hospitals that are offering that, and 65% of ovarian cancer patients had access to genetic counseling and genetic testing. So there's, and, and I have a whole string of others that we are doing. But I think the lessons I've learned uh, are that it is important to be audacious. It is important to not, not succumb to the naysayers yeah. and just keep at it. Literally, just keep, just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And, and to, be, to be really honest, if you ask me, you know, did you, did you imagine that you'll still be here 20 years later running a cancer research organization with a pea-sized budget? The honest truth is no. Honest, honest truth, I've lived most of my career thinking I'm going to close the organization in the next six months. Right? But still here you are. But still here I am. And why am I here? And the, and the reason is you kind of need to build baby steps and take people with you on those baby steps. If you tell everyone that you only have money for six months, no one will join you. But if you tell people this is where we need to get to and this is where we're gonna, where we're gonna land up, and you keep producing results, baby steps. You keep showing that actually I can do, I can set this up, I'm not bad. And then you set your goal that much further and everyone looks at you and says, that's crazy, you've got no budget, no people, how are you going to get there? How are you going to be internationally significant? We went from let's just start something to let's be nationally significant to let's be internationally significant to let's change the lives of people. I mean, that's... That's big. That's crazy, yeah. Chuang. It was never my ambition. Yeah. My ambition was to be a good wife and a good mother. It was never my ambition to be a scientist. But sometimes life gives you lemons. Well, I mean, you're always destined for, for, for great things because you were in Cambridge and you, you took a first. So obviously, you shouldn't have become a housewife because it would have been a criminal <laughs> waste of your talent. Um, but I mean, that's only part of the equation because there's also excess, there's also cost of, of the, the treatment, yeah? At the time, two and a bit years ago, uh, the experimental drug for lung cancer for my sister, there was going to be five doses, I think, and each dose is about 16,000 ringgit. Nobody can afford that except for the Tan Sri's of this world. Yes. As I so said, the gap between, um, between what we can do and what we can afford is ridiculously large it's out of and it is going to get worse, right? It's going to get worse. It's going yeah. to get worse. It's only going to get worse. But sometimes we need to reflect how we got here before, you know, I, I suppose I'm a very analytical person, right? You kind of need to reflect how you get there first, what the problem is. You need to understand the problem before you can find the solution. And the crux of the problem is the social equation that we currently have with the pharmaceutical in industry. Right? This is a social contract. It's a social contract that we don't talk about a lot. The cost of developing a drug today is roughly two billion US dollars. Okay. So you have to ask, which government is going to pay two billion US dollars to develop a drug for even a disease like nasopharyngeal cancer? Right? Is it right to go to you know, our favorite ministers and prime ministers and ask them, can you please put two billion dollars to develop a drug for nasopharyngeal cancer? They would basically say no, because A, it's long term, B, it's high risk, and C, it doesn't deliver during my political lifetime. Yeah. Right? So essentially, it's not going to happen. So the reality is the co social contract that we have with the pharmaceutical industry is you take the risk. Well, they get to pay for it, they get to monetize it, absolutely. they get the patent protection. And therefore, they need some way in which they can recoup the money. To ROI that, yeah. To ROI that, that's right. So, so I think there are starting to be questions, even in high-income countries like the UK and the US, about the patent situation and the patent contract, the patent duration. So there are important questions like, you know, 
because for some drugs, the the company makes two billion in the first year of sales, but they then have you know close to twenty years to continue selling and make two billion a year. Let's just say right? Viagra, for example, right? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, not something that's critical, but you get the point, right? Yeah. yeah. So the the whole point is, how do we change the social contract with the pharmaceutical industry? Because the reality is, for the man on the street, okay, for you and I. How many of us invest in British American tobacco? How many of us invest in pharmaceutical companies? Because these are the companies that give us a high dividend yield. We have no qualms making money in a capitalist world, but when we have, when we need the drugs, we then say, "Oh, these terrible companies! Charge how so could much, yeah. how could they charge us so much of an arm and leg?" I don't have an answer yet on how we're going to get there. But short-term solutions need to be looked at. And I believe that in, under the new government, we're starting to look at that. Number one, we need to think about purchasing. How do we purchase in bulk? Because if we don't purchase in bulk, we all lose out, right? But if you start to take contracts as an entirety, you know, not just uh, from Ministry of Health, but for Malaysia, maybe not even for Malaysia, but for ASEAN, how do we purchase drugs for a wider population? Malaysia is tiny. Malaysia is 30 million people. Well, if we're purchasing drugs for 650 million people in Southeast Asia... So it kind of starts to make sense, right? It kind of starts... People have to sit up and listen, mm. right? You, you have to start negotiating at that level in order to be able to ensure that for the men on the street, we benefit ultimately. Well, the Asian economic community is still uh, very much a twinkle in their eyes because it's taking so long uh, to come about. Um, okay, a couple of things before we let you go. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Su Huang, uh, wh where do you sit on things like uh, meat consumption and alcohol consumption where uh, they're determinants of, of cancer affliction? Is, is meat the, the, the big enemy it, it, it's made out to be? Is alcohol the big enemy it's made out to be? Alcohol, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a direct causal link? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So especially with uh, liver cancer, mm -hmm. there's a direct causal link between alcohol and uh, liver cancer. And increasingly, there's also a link with uh, other diseases like with breast cancer, even there's an association with, between alcohol and, and breast cancer. And we don't know enough about the effects of alcohol in the Asian population. Because in the Caucasian population, alcohol, um, there's an enzyme called uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase that essentially sits in your liver and breaks down that, that alcohol very quickly, right? This enzyme, it is faulty in the majority of Asians, which is wow. why Asians kind of go red quite quickly. I see. Many Asians go red very quickly because the effect of alcohol is actually different. So there have been so few studies on alcohol in the Asian population do we really want to take a chance, right? There are two ways of looking at it. Um, one is to say, oh, don't be so boring and don't drink at all and be te you know, completely dry and boring. Or, you know, take a chance and you never know what happens until the future. I would say there's a third route. The third route is probably do things in moderation, but fund research in Asians. Yeah. And if there's one message that I would, <coughs> you know, really like to say is, we cannot make decisions if we cannot make decisions if we don't know enough about the circumstances, right? And the reality is, as much as I can expound my uh, views on various aspects of cancer, much of that is still at the expert opinion level, simply because there isn't enough research in Asians. We need to be able to change that. We have to stop assuming that any Malaysian who does good quality research in Malaysia must be a second-rate, third-class scientists and no good quality we we're very good at bashing local talent we only highlight people who get awards overseas and then we say oh why don't we attract them back etc but we never look at and we never appreciate really the efforts that are being done in malaysia i would hope that maybe the only thing i've done in my life is to make it possible that we can say actually we did do something significant with the pea-sized budget that we had made possible by amazing long-term foundations like Yayasan Saim Dabi, Yayasan Petronas, the Lim Foundation and so on, as well as you know our partners in the universities, at the ministries, at uh, Kin Starfish Foundation, Estee Lauder and so on. There's so many partners that have backed us simply because they have the audacity, they, they share with us the audacity that we should not let Asians be left out. 
and we shouldn't continue to just assume that Malaysians can't do or do good quality work. We, we have to support more of this. We have to make sure that even if it's not available yet in the clinic in my lifetime, it changes the lifetimes in, in my daughter's generation, in my son's generation, and in future generations. The system that we create will ensure that we're not left out. This is for us, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess parting shots for you, for the rest of the world, um, girls and science, because I've got a daughter as well. I'd love for her to be able to do stuff as material as you. What is your message to them? I think, um, you know, there's a lot of data to say that we're never going to achieve gender equality, at least for the next 200 years, right? And it's even worse in science. The reality is that there are a lot of females that do science, but it's very hard to climb that ladder because at the time at which you're climbing that ladder, it's also when you need to, to take family. time off and yeah. have a, a family and, a, you know, and so on. So I would say that um, I've been able to do what I do because I've got an incredibly supportive husband but more important than that, I've got an incredibly supportive um, parents and in-laws and extended family that has made it possible for me to do what I do. You know? So I think if we're, if we're going to be real about um, with girls making it in science, we have to make it possible for them to do that. And currently, we don't make it possible because it's left to chance. It's left to people like me who by chance have that, that supportive family. But for many other girls, they don't, and they really do drop by the wayside. So we need to think about social change in a way that enables women generally, not just girls in science, women generally, to truly contribute to the economy, to truly be a voice, right? We have to stop having panels that are all men, number Absolutely. one. Absolutely. We have to <laughs> really just stop having panels. Now, I, there, there really should not be any panels where it's all men. We, we have to make sure that there are crashes in, in, um, in working environments. You know, how many buildings do we have that, that have, like, uh, we, we have to ask, right? At TRX, for example, or at Merdeka 188, have they really looked at crashes and being able to provide for women to work in that environment? Have we done that? I haven't been inside there, but I wager more likely not than, than yes. <laughs> That's the point. Right. So, so it's not just, I think the point I'm trying to get at is women have a role to play because women think differently. The, the honest truth is I, I do think that men and women are different species and we have different goals. Our aspirations are different, right? Uh, what motivates us are different. But working together, that diversity enables us to achieve something much better. But we have to be a lot more inclusive if we're going to be able to make the type of social change that builds for a better tomorrow. I think I couldn't have said it any better, Su Huang. It's a huge privilege, and uh, thank you for coming on. And thank I hope you. to speak to you again, maybe in, I don't know, one or two years when you've made another breakthrough in your research. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chuang. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Cheers, thanks.